Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Joseph Alexander. Hi Joseph. Hello, how are you doing? I'm great, it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Joseph is a musician and the author of over 40 books on playing guitar. He's one of the few seven-figure non-fiction indie authors. I'm very excited uh, to be talking to you today, but start with, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and self-publishing. Um, how I got into writing? Well, I was teaching a lot of guitar. Uh, I've done that for a long time, and I just started writing down um, sort of the, the, the common things that came up with my students, particularly sort of regarding jazz. And I wanted to write down sort of a pretty sort of no-nonsense path for, for my students who were wanting to learn jazz. Mm -hmm. Then somebody told me about, I think, they told me about Create Space first, and I found KDP through that. Um, and that that was it really I, I sort of put the book up it became a book you know and um, with absolutely no expectations this is about this is actually five years ago just had the anniversary of the first book and yeah like it just sort of started to sell you know like one or two copies a day kind of thing and I thought well that's sort of a good idea I wonder if like you know I'm teaching other stuff I'll put that up and kind of just kept going really sort of got a bit like obsessed with the whole thing and I was teaching and I, at the time I was still teaching guitar after about I think two years sort of the uh, I was selling enough books to kind of move to Thailand kept writing out there sort of sitting by the pool with the guitar just sort of writing and self-publishing from there and, and just being traveling around writing and and that's it really it was it was kind of an accident <laughs> it was never it was never meant to be this this kind of crazy thing that it's turned into which is very cool so so i'm interested just in your terms of your music so mm. obviously you would you said you were teaching music but mm. you know do you have some kind of rock and roll or jazz or history where you were in a band and then started teaching or like you know what's your well, history before that yeah i did a little bit when i was i went to I did music at A level and I went to London College of Music, which was at the time the Guitar Institute, which was like the, the sort of the, um, it was kind of the UK version of Berkeley or Musicians Institute, you know, in in, um, in, in the States. So it was it was a good school. And I'll, honestly, I probably wasn't quite good enough to be there. I really struggled and I didn't have the greatest time in London. Mm. Um, I got very confused by a lot of the musical things and um and and sort of not the theory as much but i didn't realize kind of there was a difference between say miles davis and alan holdsworth for example and i was trying to play all this stuff at the same time and i didn't have it organized in my head so um i didn't do very well there until i sort of i quit that course and had a year off and then i went to leeds college of music where i actually studied jazz so i sort of got an ama had an amazing experience in leeds and mm. And, and the sort of clarification of all that was, I, you know, I had this great teacher who just said, well, you're trying to go from here to here in one step. Let's just do little bits at a time. And, and that sort of, that kind of, that helped me a lot as a musician to develop. And that's that sort of realization was what I've kind of kept with me as a teacher, um, you know, with what my one-on-one -on -one students when I was teaching that, which teaching them, but also in the books, just trying to do sort of a step-by-step -step thing. So yeah, London College of Music, Leeds College of Music, lots of teaching and um, bit of bit of gigging. But I'm probably not the rock star I would like to be, I guess. Oh no, clearly you're a writer. <laughs> um, yeah, apparently. apparently. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm really interested in that because so you have over forty books, and we're going to come back to co-writing. But you said there, you know, that you you obviously had some self doubt. You didn't, you know, how? So I guess the question is, how do you go from not feeling like the expert because, like you've admitted, you you know, you you weren't the expert, and I guess you're still not. I mean, who is the best musician in the world? Well, and yeah, then, but how can you? Yeah, how can you go from that? To, you know feeling that self-doubt to doing quite prescriptive how-to books on yeah on writing. it does, it does oh, sorry it music. Does sometimes feel like I'm a complete like chancer and I've got no business sort of doing it but I think the one thing is I, I'm certainly I got really good feedback as, as a teacher and one of the things that I you know I do believe that I'm, I'm good at is I'm good at breaking down the information 
And so you get these sort of very complicated subjects in music and, mm. you know, what with YouTube and the internet being like this, people like to make things more complicated. And certainly university professors like to make things complicated mm. and expensive so they can sort of sell it as a, as a kind of product, I guess. But I think because I struggled at university, like I was always a decent player. Um, but because I didn't pick things up as quickly as everyone else, I think I had this sort of mental process where I had to break things down differently and organize it in my brain differently so I could play it. Um, and I, th I think, if anything, that's what makes me a good teacher, if I, if I, if I am, you know, hopefully I am. And, um, you know, people sort of seem to respond to it um, and... I think that's one of the strengths of my books is I do break things down very, very sort of minutely step by step and and teach it as I learnt it myself or how I would how I would teach it to a private student in front of me. Mm, no, and that's fantastic because I think many non fiction well, I do. I mean, I'm, you know, I have books on for writers and yet I'm not James Patterson, <laughs> you know, so how, how do I have the right to do that? So you've, you've talked about their step-by-step -step approaches, but what other tips do you have for people who are writing non-fiction uh, in order to, to do that successfully? In, in the writing bit, we'll come to the marketing. In the writing bit, bit I think you have to start... I, my, my actual process when I'm writing is I imagine the student like in front of me. I've done you know, thousands of private lessons, so I kind of imagine, okay, this student's come to me and they want to learn, for example, blues, rhythm, guitar. And, okay, let's just say, for example, they can play a few chords and they can, you know, I don't have to worry about their technique too much, but they don't know anything about that genre. So I'll start from absolute zero, essentially, assuming that they can play guitar and go, right, well, what's the first thing? And when they can do that, and when they can do that, and when they can do that, and you just sort of build up. And of course, with anything, you can you can tangent very easily. If you look at this, and there's like 30 things on that same level, which which you could be doing. But I think one of the skills is to to sort of prioritize that information because if it's a private one-on-one -on -one lesson with a student, yeah, we can sort of digress, and I can sort of quickly show them something which might spark off an idea. But when you're writing, you have to take a linear path and be very sort of strict with yourself about what's going to get included and when. And I think as you're writing it and you go, oh, I could digress into here, I, if it's not appropriate for that book, then I'll write it down, I'll put it on my list of stuff to do, and that can even become another book in the future. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've got quite a lot of books, because I go into massive amounts of detail about quite a small, specific area of music each time. And I think, I think that, that really helps, because I remember getting books when I was, you know, in, in like teenage years, and it would, it would touch on everything very, very lightly, and it was almost like a, it was more of a frustration because there's like a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit. And you, I think one of the things with music or writing or, or whatever it happens to be, I think immersion as, as an artist or immersion as somebody that's producing content, I think that's really the only, the only way to, to go with it. Because if, if you're not immersed, you just have this sort of superficial knowledge and you've just got to get your hands dirty and wade right in there. And I mean, you mentioned there a few a few thoughts around sort of the the other books and why you have so many because you go into detail. But how do you decide which books to write next? Because I kind of I see what you mean. I mean, it's not if you wrote one book on how to play the guitar, it, it would, mm. as you say, be at such a high level, it wouldn't be useful. So I, yeah. I imagine you have this massive list. So how do you decide which one to do next? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting through it. Um, <laughs> the, um, how do I decide what to do next? Well, yeah, there is the list, I suppose. And when I first started out, it was just, I wrote, I was writing books about what I was teaching at the time. You know, I load my first sort of probably 15 to 20 beginners guitar lessons are give or take the same. So, you know, there's, there's a book right there. And, you know, that's the sort of, you know, I was getting good results. It seemed to be kind of field proven. So, I, you know, I wrote it down in the book. Um how do I do what's next? I mean, at the, at the beginning, it was just like, oh yeah, no, I can do this, I can do this. Because I wasn't, I wasn't sort of taking it seriously. It was just something that I was doing, you know, as, as a music teacher, I was teaching privately at my house and 
students were coming to me after about sort of, you know, when school kicked out at 3.30. So I had all like the time during the day to be writing. So it's just like, oh yeah, no, that's a good idea. And I've just started writing. As I sort of had to get a little bit more business minded, there's this sort of, there's this, not nasty, but there's this little part of you where you sort of, right, okay, well, what's going to be really useful, but also what's going to be commercial? Mm. And I think the truth of the matter is prob- probably this is true, I would have thought, that any genre of any teaching writing, there's going, to, there's going to be more beginner and intermediate level students than really advanced students, you know, of, mm. of course, you know, sort of stands to reason. So you kind of aim to be writing a, around about that that sort of standard, I guess. Like I've got like one of the fa- one of my favourite books that I did was um, really advanced sort of jazz chord voicings book for like really advanced kind of players. And of course, it sells a couple of copies. But this mm-hmm. sort of you know, it's a good book. But my sort of blues rhythm guitar book, which is sort of beginner to intermediate, just you know, sells hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies like consistently. So. Um, you do have to be sort of mindful of, okay, if I'm going to spend a month writing, promoting this book, getting it out there, is that going to be the best use of that month? Mm. And um, I, I think that aside, I've said this sort of in interviews before, so I, I get that asked this quite a lot. You know, people talk about the money thing, and the money has to be like a side effect. Because if you start going into this, this is a really, really key point. You know, people go, oh, yeah, write books, make money. It's not that because, you, A, you might not enjoy it, mm. and you won't be passionate about what you're writing, and your audience will feel that, I believe. You know, I would have thought. But you, you want to be writing because, you know, in, in certainly my, my niche, that because you want to help people. And the, the thing that I've tried to kind of really cling on to it was that sort of bad experience at university. So actually, you know, there, there are going to be people in my situation where there's all these hundreds of possible potential routes to go down and they're confused and they don't know what's next. And I actually want to write something that's, that's going to take that kind of conflicts away from musicians and help them get better as guitarists. You know, that's sort of my, my mission and that's kind of what, you know, it's a publishing company that I run now and I publish loads of other people. So the whole thing is, is this going to help people? And then the second question is, okay, well, kind of, is it, is it commercial, you know? And um, I, we've, got loads, we've got books that probably aren't doing as well as they could, but I think, you know, for the right person, they're really going to help them. And that, that's genuinely, like, the, the priority with everything that we release. Yeah, I totally get you. And I mean, no one can do 40 odd books on a very, you know, narrow yeah. niche without actually caring about that topic. So, you know, it's not like you've gone, I need to make money with books. You know, you've come in with the guitar yeah. first. And I, I hear yeah. you about the um, the beginners to advance because I wrote a very developed book called Business for Authors and mm. it sold very few copies. Um, so I did How to Make a Living with Your Writing, which is kind of yeah. like, you know, a much smaller version and it doesn't mention like accountants and tax and that one sells tons so you know aiming at that smaller market even though the material is actually quite similar it's it's quite Mm. interesting but I wanted to ask you um about just about teaching you know did you because I do know uh, I interviewed another guy years ago and I can't remember his name now but on teaching guitar on YouTube so why did you and of course there's teachable there's ways to do video courses Mm. why did you decide on books over doing video teaching and video courses um I I don't know I think I think there's a there's a huge amount of sort of peripheral work that goes into videos, as I'm sure you know, because you, you know you do a lot of these and you know, probably the amount of time that you spend editing or and, and, and getting these things together, and I, that's something that never really appeals to me, you know, and there's a lot of people, that, at the time, that, that there's, there's um, jamplay.com, you know, they've got amazing video lessons that, you know, it's a subscription-based thing, and I'm sort of looking at, well, could I do that better? Probably not. You know, not without completely neglecting like my my book writing and book publishing thing. It's it's almost such a it's so well covered, it's so well done that I don't think I could 
compete or, or do much that that would add to it really you know so for me like the books books turned out really well and I think I think I'm I'm very lucky that I'm doing music tuition I think that's something that people like to learn from books it's kind of you know obviously you have you can have private teachers but you know that sort of idea of getting your guitar getting your first chords book and 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 things um that that yeah it's quite an immediate and it yeah, I'm sorry. I'm lucky. I'm lucky that it's sort of almost like the established method of doing it, really. And hmm. when, yeah, that's great. when, yeah, sorry, Paul. Yeah, no. Well, and then we, I, I love that answer because so many people are jumping on the course bandwagon. So I'm glad you've gone. Well, mm. other people are doing it well. But let's then talk about the the print books because you have a very print based business, which for many yeah. in, for many indies is kind of upside down. So mm. what you know, I guess you've talked a little bit about it, but why are print books such a big part of your business? And can you talk a bit about the pricing as well? Yeah, um, that came up on the Facebook thing the yeah. other day. Yeah. Um, I I really wish that we didn't have to do Kindle books. You know, like we, we do and we put the work in, you know, we make them as great as possible. But I, I really think that, I don't know if I'm just old-fashioned, but you learn better from a piece of paper, certainly music, certainly music, because the dots are in front of you on the page. And you can have it on your music stand, and it's not a shiny screen, you know. It's got... It's got excuse the pun, but it's got a bit of weight to it. You know, it's it's sort of a tangible thing. You go, right, I'm going to do music. It's this, this book's coming out. I'm going to sit and I'm going to look at it. Whereas sort of Kindle, you grab the Kindle, open the book, and, and you're sort of looking at things. It, it seems a little bit um, distant in a way to me. It doesn't seem quite as sort of, like, tangible, like I say. Uh, I think, you know, from, from doing this for a while, my feeling is that most people... Um, most people feel the same way. I think that's something, you know, you think music book, you don't think music Kindle, mm. kind of thing. Um, so so that, that sort of obviously really works to to our advantage. Um, and, I, yeah, I wish everybody bought the paperback books because I just think, you know, not you know, like money aside, I just think that it's a better way to learn music. I think it's the best way to learn most things. There's been loads of studies done that, you retain less information if you read it off a like a reflective screen, you know, a shiny kind of screen. Um, pricing wise, we've got some books that are, you know, this is getting to the business side of thing. We've got a few books that are lead generation, which we have on Kindle, sort of pricing price very low, which yeah, they're good books, but we sort of price them low so we can bring people onto the mailing list and do you know marketing that side that way. Um, sort of. If, if I, it's kind of my feeling. If I feel the book sort of a bit lighter, you know, not not light in content, not you know, not a cop out of, of a book, but just sort of a little bit less uh, intricate. I was sort of try and price them about fifteen pounds, uh, sorry, fourteen pounds, and then if it's um, if it's like a quite a weighty sort of tome, then it's probably about sixteen, seventeen pounds. Mm. Um, you yeah, know, and, and in the US, that's about. I think the max we charge it now is about eighteen ninety nine dollars, and the cheaper ones are about fourteen ninety nine dollars. And I mean, some people will be like, "That sounds expensive for a print book," but I guess it does. In the music, <laughs> is that in the music niche? Is that a kind of normal price? So, you, it's, or it's are a, you pricing yeah. higher? It's about it's about right. You know, there's there's a sort of particular book you can get. It's called the Real Book. It's a book of jazz charts. It's got like that thick, and you know, you go and that's about thirty quid. That book, thirty or forty quid. And mm. I think there's something where when you're passing on expertise, I mean, you, you're not going to get an hour private lesson with me for twenty dollars. Like no way. Not even you know, like I was sort of charging about thirty, thirty-five pounds five, six years ago. You know, when I was teaching privately one-on-one. I reckon most of our books would take you six six months to a year to get through, probably. Mm. So I think when you look at it as that kind of value for money thing, it's you know all the information's there. You've got audio downloads with it. You know you've got um, every you know you've got years of expertise and experience going into those books. And I think to get one for less than sort of the price of a half hour lesson with a with a decent teacher, I think I think that's all right. 
Yeah, no, and, and I think that's really important for people listening because non-fiction, you can price higher than mm-hmm. fiction. And, you know, there's there's less discounting, I think, because of if people mm-hmm. want to buy a book on jazz guitar, they're going to buy it. They're not going to be like, yeah. you know, there aren't millions of those books. But um, so how are you, uh, are you using Ingram Spark? Because you're going into bookstores, aren't you? You're actually getting stocked. Yeah, it's a little bit different. Actually, I'm in the middle of... A- bit of negotiation with um, Ingram at the moment so I'm not going to talk about that too much um, but yeah we are um, basically create space for all the paperback stuff and that goes straight to Amazon however it's a little bit different I guess with music because you you want to be dealing with a music supplier you know music book distributor I should say and the biggest one in the UK is a company called Music Sales Limited and I think this is sort of a bit of a maybe a change of paradigm. I think this is quite a useful thing for for, for writers to realise. When I when I approach music sale of my catalogue, I approach them with eighteen books. Mm-hmm. And I approach them with like probably two or three years, whatever, sales on Amazon as like, here's the Kindle sales, here's the paperback sales, we are making this much, here are here's the figures. Do you want to part of this? So it wasn't that kind of traditional like publisher distributor relationship where they're going, well, yeah, can we make money out of you? I'm coming to them saying this is really successful. You can have a piece of it if you want to, and it was sort of that change of like I, I didn't appreciate that at the time. I was like, oh god, I'm, I'm approaching like a big distributor, and they were really into it. And they, you know, I think their first order was like just under twenty thousand pounds worth of books mm. from me. So it was like it was a big deal. It was a really big deal, and. Unfortunately, they, they they sell slowly in music music bookshops. They do, and um, everyone buys online now. And I, you know, I don't know what's sort of going on with music sales at the moment, but they're not taking a huge amount of books off us. So, you know, I think hope, hopefully that's not my books being rubbish. It's just sort of a state of the industry thing, and mm. um, that sort of general shift to online online buying of everything. I think so. Yeah, for me, it's not like approaching gardeners like, will you distribute this or Waterstones or, you know, whoever it happens to be. It, it was like there, there's one place in the UK. And we, we spoke to Hal Leonard, who weren't really interested, which is fine. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't really understand that decision because, again, we were sort of showing them sales and they're like, well, we've got our own thing going on. It's like, right, fine. Mm. Um, but I think the. It's been said to me a few times that like the fact that I've kind of come along and it's it's disrupting that that industry now because we like I I like, I try not to do this too much but I stuck something up on Facebook the other day and I think I had like the top fourteen or fifteen music books on Amazon at that time like it was like one to fourteen I think blocked out they were all books that I'd written or had published mm. and. The next few books weren't Hal Leonard or Musicians Institute or Berkeley Press. It was other, I think, independent publishers and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, it, it's the industry's changing, and I think you know it's sort of it's all to play for really with with people that like, people can come and do this. And I know I was speaking to a guy the other day who's doing this with like gardening books or you know what. If you are a non-fiction author, or even if you've got a speciality, you know, you, you yourself, John, like, you, I'm good at writing, I'm good at selling books. I can write a non-fiction book on how to do this with authority, and I can make it great. Hmm. Anyone can do that if you've got special specialism and an expertise in something, and you you're, you're good at explaining things. Then why not? You know, why not start putting stuff out there? Because you know, the, you can get straight to your audience. So there's no sort of gatekeeper publishers anymore it's you can get straight there yeah no fantastic so then you know the big question people have now and in my mind is how did you get the top 14 books or whatever in that category can can you give us some of your um, marketing tips yeah. as in uh, for example you mentioned email list um yeah. obviously i mean if people come into your funnel you've got a hell of a lot of books but what, what are your some of yeah. your marketing tips it's all email marketing all of it, and um, we e- we, ma- we email a lot, and the people that don't want to get them, they, they leave, and that's fine because it's sort of it becomes a sort of self fulfilling cycle, really. That um, 
we market the books well on email, so they go up on Amazon. Amazon promotes them in their sort of ecosystem. More people buy it, more people come onto the, the mailing list, and it's just a cycle now. And you know, I think we, we get between sort of thirty and sixty signups a day. So like the mailing list is just about to hit thirty seven thousand, and um, you know we're going up probably over a thousand people a month. So yeah, like no secrets. I'm, I'm really happy to talk about this sort of stuff. But we, if you come on, you, you buy a book. So your Kindle or paperback, and in there, like after the sort of introduction section, there's a heading, get the audio. And this is like, this is my kind of looking out, I have the advantage here, because we, I get to give away the audio recordings of each example in the book, so like 100 audio files. Mm. So if you want to get the audio, you go to my website, you stick your email address in, you choose your book, right. and then you get access to your audio. So that means that we know which book they bought. Magic. And oh, that's the, magic. Oh, right? fantastic. And, that's amazing. And because and, that's what everyone has a problem with. And like, unless you have a separate sign up for every single book, most people have a real issue um, yeah. with that. So that, just that those audio files, are they, are you playing those? Like, how do you have the rights to use the, I presume they're tunes. Songs. No, like again, that's again, that's sort of quite a, a sort of little nuanced part of the industry, but of, of my my niche, I should say. But um, we we don't do tunes that are written. Like I wouldn't sort of do a book of a new Ed Sheeran like album because I wouldn't have the right, and it'd be very expensive to get that. I tend to write methods, so I don't need to kind of be using specific tunes. I can use things that are similar. You know, uh, and keep it similar so there's no copyright infringement. But that's sort of just careful writing of, of the music example. So each book, every book that I've written has probably got over 100 notated examples. So, it's, you know, our books are image heavy. It's a bit of a nightmare for Kindle with the download size of the books. But, yeah, there's like 100 plus, 150 examples. So you want to hear those. And there are sort of two bar examples, you know, right. that one kind of music. Hmm. Um, actually, sorry. Um, yeah. No, sorry. I, I'm just just thinking that. Oh, you could show uh, one for the people page. on people on the video. You, we can see yeah. a page with some music on. Yeah, because I was so wondering just, about that. So your print costs must be higher. Oh no, maybe they are. Uh, no, print costs the same. It's just. Um, it's, I guess yeah. It's Kindle not books more. Around 106 pages. Yeah, the Kindle thing's a nightmare. Cause yeah. Our, our book sizes tend to be about five megabytes, four to five megabytes. So we're paying about an extra ATP or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... Yeah. It's, I mean, that's that's the thing, but. Again, and with Kindle being what it is, we can't really charge more than five ninety nine really for a Kindle book, and it's kind of it's painful. But like I say, your business the, is print, really. So well, yeah, but because the Kindle books rank so highly, and I think that it's not a particularly competitive category either. So the Kindle books rank highly; people, they get found because of that on Amazon, and people go, "Oh, right, it's got a paperback for twenty dollars. I'll I'll grab that one." So. Mm. You know, swing, swings and roundabouts with it, but like, you know, maybe feelings on Kindle alone. It's just, um, so, they, yeah. stick there, they tell us what book they bought. So now we know what genre they're interested in, whether blues, jazz, rock, blah, blah, blah. And we also know what book they, they've got. Mm. And then this is one of the most expensive things I ever had to do for the business. It was like on a par with translating all the books into Spanish, German, and uh, <laughs> Portuguese. But we, we got this amazing team in, um, and they were based in New Zealand, and they wrote this automated emailing system, and it's huge. So if you buy a blues book, first of all, you get like a cool welcome series of emails. So there's like a little video of me going, hello, thanks for buying my book. And then there's a couple of emails that follow up every, every couple of days just saying, oh, we've got like 250 lessons on the guitar on, on our website for free. Just go check this stuff out. These are our favorites. And then that finishes. And then each week, we send them two lessons, pretty much two lessons, and a promotion for the book that those relations, those lessons are kind of promoting. So again, like free lesson, good content, you know. Um, so each week, there, if you if you start on week one, you, you go through and you get like say blues one promotion, but then week two you're going to get like blues two promotion and then week three you get blues three or whatever. But of course, because people are starting that sequence at different times and people are working all the way through, and I think that's like about a 30-odd, 40-odd week series of promotions now, mm. like automations, 
the and we've got one of those for blues, one of those for jazz, one of those for rock, one of I think we've got one for beginners and one for theory and technique type stuff. The loads of all the books are being promoted to a small amount of people all the time. Mm. And that's it. So, you know, a lot of people go, right, I've released my new book. I've got a thousand people on my mailing list. Bam. Send it out and you're done. Like, what can you possibly do? Oh, you know, the next week, just, okay, people who didn't open it, maybe send it again. But that's sort of it. You've kind of, it, it's sort of done. You release your book. But we kind of, we introduce people to new books all the time. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it is a trickle of sales. But it's enough to keep things ranking very highly, ranking constantly, getting reviews. We support that with AMS, but you know, AMS being worth it is, I don't think we spend more than seven or eight hundred pounds a month promoting. Mm. I've got 55, 50 odd books in the, in the catalogue now. So yeah, it, it's email, and, and because people sort of keep coming at the top, it's like one of those marble run things. Yeah. <laughs> um, the that we're sort of always getting, you know, fresh people in. And the content, I think, really important before everyone just starts, like, sending thousands of emails, the content that pr we provide is good. <laughs> and it's, like, yeah. good website lessons, and it's useful, and it's not just, like, hey, download my free PDF, you know, to, to, so you can get the email address. The first thing is if you're going to get people's email address, what you're providing them with on that that landing page has to be really useful, and it has to be integral to the book i think mm. um and then once you do that if you're going to be emailing people a lot you have to be providing value if you're just going buy my book buy my book buy my book you, you're unsubscribe and you're spam instantly it doesn't work mm. and you upset people yeah well i know how much work that is i've thought about doing this so many times and then just backed away because i mean especially yeah. because you're adding quite a lot of books per year so every time you add a new book are you kind of adding to this email sequence yeah. system yeah we're sort of tacking it on at the end that's probably not the most effective way to do it but yeah and we'll be like I've, we're releasing a book about every two weeks at the moment wow okay let's come to that how are you releasing yeah. a book every two weeks i um about three years ago a guy called sam said i've written this book I can see you've been quite successful with, with what you're doing. Will you will you help me publish it? I was like, yes. And the kind of deal we agreed that I would put it out to my mailing list and I would do the covers and I would do everything that made it into a book. Mm. He would provide the writing, the notation, you know, the musical examples and the audio. For that, we would split the royalties 50-50. And suddenly overnight, I was kind of a little mini publishing company, bought my imprint, you know, and um, and that was that. So that that book does all right. And since then, I think at the moment I'm working, I was trying to work it out the other day, but I'm working with probably about 10 to 15 authors at the moment. Wow. So, yeah, so like I, I am writing. I'm kind of outsourcing a bit of my writing to a very good friend, like my old guitar teacher at the moment. And mm. he, he not he's not doing the writing, that's not fair to say, but he's kind of getting the music together for it so I can write. But most of my time now I'm publishing and we've got a great system. I like uh, you know, one of the things that I get asked about a lot is the freelancers. We've we've got loads of freelancers working for us, which can be a pain but it can also be absolutely amazing and mm -hmm. stuff just gets done, you know, that you don't have to, to worry about. So I've got a copy editor, I've got someone that does images, the promotion side of things. I, I went on Upwork and I found six translators to, to tran translate all my books. And they're all good guitarists, you know, finding a translator mm -hmm. who's a great guitarist was really, really tough. But we, we found them and we suddenly went from I think it's about 40 books to about 120 books in a period of six months. Wow. So while they don't sell loads, it's sort of opened. Uh, Amazon's kind of moving into Brazil, so we're kind of hitting the Portuguese there. I've been contacted by a music shop in Sao Paulo. And we're, you know, we're going to be trying to put, you know, a deal together there so I can supply those guys. And you know, we're selling books in Spain and Germany, and it's a trickle. But I think I invested something like ten thousand pounds in getting oh I mean, it was that's really cheap like 40 books essentially all in three languages really cheap but that paid for itself within about six to twelve months you know so it's sort of it's worth doing you know it's worth doing 
I think I've got a bit off track here. I think what we were talking about publishing schedules and things like that. Well, so yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, I was going to say so because uh, many people who get to this point, and I'm definitely behind you, but you know, I, I definitely struggle with managing everything. What What are you using to manage everyone? Like, do you use Asana? Do you use you know, uh, or um, are you at the top just emailing everywhere, <laughs> or do you have a CEO? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like it, it's been a problem. Like, I've had a couple of generally like 99 percent of stuff runs really smoothly but when you get that problem it, it, it can be quite big and um that, that's not to say that it's a, it's a bad thing I, I highly recommend that if if there's anything it almost doesn't matter if, if you've got any sort of spare cash and it doesn't have to be expensive if there's something you find yourself doing repeatedly that you don't enjoy and that's taking you away from writing then give it to someone else to do because it for your own sanity in terms of managing it i have an amanda my girlfriend who we've been together like seven years she's uh, she works for the company she's co-director of, of my company um and she's really really good with people mm. <laughs> which is not one of my skills so quite a lot of the time i'm just like sweetheart can you just um take care of that for me she's like yep yeah, and it and it happens because i i i, I don't really i'm not good at that no, well, that's, okay. that, yeah, that's great. I mean, she sounds like a CEO type person or a COO, like a director of operations, just gets yeah. it done, which is which is really good. So uh, we there's so many things we want to do. We're, we're actually almost running out of time. Oh, and gosh, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. <laughs> and what I did, I definitely wanted to ask you because hmm. um, many people listening will just be on, say, a couple of hundred dollars a month income or maybe a couple of thousand. Um, so I wanted to ask you about two kind of tipping points. When did the business go from, you know, to six figures? So how many books and how did that happen? And then how did it go from six figures up to seven figures? Like what were the things that made those jumps? Because I think those are big jumps that many people, yeah. you know, that yeah. mark a business. Uh, yeah. Really. Um, I'd have to pull out my spreadsheet. Of, <laughs> well, of, just of, roughly, just roughly. roughly. I think, you know, I was, I left the UK, I think I was making, when I went to Thailand, it was just sort of, right, glass of champagne on the plane sort of thing. I think I was making about 8,000 pounds a month, which is what, like, what, 10, 11,000 dollars a month, I guess. So that, that would be six figures. And I think that was with... 12 books maybe 12 okay yeah yeah um so that, that was sort of around about the hundred thousand dollar mark i guess and then obviously i mean i'm not you know with with sort of turning over mid mid six figures at the moment um obviously we've been doing this for quite a few years so the seven figures is there but um we hit seven figures a year in um uh, a year ago actually hmm. just after a year ago so that would have been probably about maybe 30 books i think like don't quote me on that sort of ballpark i guess i'd have to really really look into that one hmm. i think the, the, the key point that i would draw people to draw people's attention to that is the brand recognition thing like hopefully you know hopefully like, without being arrogant hopefully the quality is there you know hmm. about you know, sort of you know that sort of goes without saying that you have to have that um, the brand recognition thing. So here's, here's that book again, and like all my books sort of vaguely look like that. You know, if you go and search yeah. Joseph Alexander guitar on Amazon, you'll you'll find my stuff, and it's just like, oh, that you know that publishing company's written all of these books. So having that, that's sort of templated. I can just drop in a guitar or drop in a you know whatever an image, whatever I need to. And, and so if you see one book and it's got like 300 positive reviews, uh, and there's another book next to it with, with less, then there's that association. It's brand recognition as as well, and it was it wasn't all, all an accident, you know. That I, I was really bad at making covers, uh, so actually I thought, it would, I thought it would come up. But when I start first like start publishing, I was making my own covers, and it was like that. Mm. And I just dug this out. It's like pretty awful. And then that's the same book a few years later when we redid it, and it's it's still not like where I want it to be, but. I think they're great. Um, I mean, people on the audio only, they do have a guitar on, so they're very kind of yeah. clear. But they all yeah. look, I did have a look on Amazon, they all look kind of the same with different colours and different topics, yeah. Um, yeah. Which, which I think is very, designs. yeah, I think that's yeah. really important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the one thing, you know, this is a huge advantage of doing sort of non fiction stuff is the fact that you can be very SEO friendly with your titles. 
Mm. You know, like my books are not like, you know, the ethereal goddess of kind of <laughs> folk guitar. You know, it's like folk guitar, play folk guitar sort of thing, or guitar technique, or guitar theory, or blues guitar rhythm, blues guitar soloing. You know, you can be that, and then you've got your, your subheading as well. So definitely get the SEO stuff into the into the book titles as, as well so mm. and your website yeah. i mean how much do you sell from the website or how much do you think you sell through the website versus amazon or you know i guess yeah your yeah, website we versus P- amazon uh oh, well amazon, amazon hands down um i know probably combined kindle and paperback we sell about six thousand books a month on amazon we sell probably about a thousand dollars worth, maybe fifteen hundred dollars worth a month of PDF books from mm. the website. But to be honest, in the last three or four books, I've not bothered doing PDF books because okay. we're finding that Kindle Select, like Kindle Unlimited, is is working better for us in terms of ranking on Amazon. So mm. it's yeah, we make a lot more money per book selling a PDF from our own site. But, you know, yeah. it's better to make you know, a dollar a thousand times. Yeah. So um, what what are the, what are any other things that you think indies are doing wrong or some of your thoughts on what, you know, the, what's happening or why you're successful and, and, and what are others doing wrong, I guess? Because you said you had some opinions oh. that were slightly not the same as, yeah, as other people. Yeah, it's just sort of, sort of uh, cause I feel, yeah, I, one thing that I, I see, and this is this is very nonfiction based, so don't mm. take this, if, you know, if you're not listening to me, just, I just hate your book. Uh, people say um, don't reply to your reviews, and I will happily reply to a negative review. Review, especially if it's you know somebody's having like a technical problem, um, with a, we're getting the audio, or you know they're, they're, they've said something that's kind of inaccurate about the book. I'll pick them up on it, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I think it's okay to respond to reviews in in this sort of the field, I, I guess. Um, the other thing is you know this sort of don't, not emailing people like we we don't spam like don't get me wrong mm-hmm. we spam and it's on like thousands and thousands of emails with the same thing but this kind of oh yeah maybe just stay in touch once a month with your once every couple of weeks with your audience and you know they'll be like people don't read emails that that's kind of unfortunately the sort of the truth of it and the people, if, say into the freebie, if you've got email addresses, that way, generally, what I see, so I work on Readsy as well, you know, we do consultations to people there, is, is that people who get email addresses in that way, often, you know, the response rate isn't good, the open rate isn't good, because they're inundated, and they've, they've signed up for so many free book sites, and that the, the, you don't stand out. Mm. Um, so you, you have to, yeah, and you if people, you know, the big thing is, oh, I sent an email and like 20 people unsubscribed from my list. Like, well, they didn't want to be there. They weren't going to buy anything from you anyway. It's not about having a big email list, although, you know, it kind of helps. It's, it's a case of having a, an involved, you know, like a community of, of your email list. Yeah, if you send a couple of emails and, and people are still on there, that's great. They're listening to you. They're very likely to buy. If you send them one email and they just disappear, then... They they weren't going to do anything hmm. for you anyway. So so there's that that kind of thing. Don't don't be afraid to email people. Don't spam them, but hmm. send them useful stuff. You know, develop a relationship with with the people that are reading your book. You know, that's that's it. But yeah, absolutely. You know, just biggest tip. Yeah, sort of why I've been successful. It was an accident. I hands down, I never meant to do this. This was just something I sort of fell into. Um, but. It's get something that's integral to your book that people want to have. Put an email wall in front of it. Promote it in your book. Get that email. Be really organized about it. Know, you know like what book people have come in through. You can use things like Genius Link or stuff like that to track people through and be super organized with your list. So when I launch a, when I launch a death metal book, I'm not going to launch out to my like jazz jazz guys, right? Mm. Sort of no brainer. So that if, if you can be that organized with your mailing list, um, then you're more likely to show people the content that they want to see. Yeah, well, I have a whole list of to do's after this chat. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been fantastic. So tell people where they can find you and your books and everything online. Um, yeah, like the, the best way is Joseph Alexander Guitar on Amazon. That will always show, show up. Uh, my website is fundamental dash 
changes or fundamental hyphen changes if, you, if you're English. Um, and if you if you want to, like, you probably unsubscribe really quickly. But if you do, da- just go onto the download the audio page um, and sign up and just see what we do. You know, you probably want, if you're not interested in guitar, you probably will unsubscribe really quickly. But I'd say stay on for a few weeks just to see how we send out content, and it is all automated. Mm. Um, so that that would probably be quite a good lesson, I think, for people in in terms of how to maximise that mailing list. No, that's brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Joseph. That was great. Okay, thank you very much for having me on. It's been flattered to be here.